Hey, I'm trying something new today. I don't know how this is going to work. I put the camera down there, although although I'm looking up here. I'm not sure that's going to work because I'm going to have to be looking up here, not at the camera. And I don't know of an, I didn't really think about that because I was looking down and it looks great from here. I can also adjust the uh, level of zoom. That's a little closer or I can make it wide, which I've put the camera down on my desk and maybe here, let me. I don't know if that works. I don't like this angle. <laughs> it's not as good. It's, I'm, I'm playing with the camera. Let's see. Oh, I got to point it down. That's, oh, then you see my keyboard. This is goofy. It doesn't work. I don't know. I was playing around with some ideas, just trying to, because, you know, I'm always looking down. Now I'm looking up. Now you're looking at me looking up. The only other thing I could think, if I, if, let me see, do I have something? What if I just took this Clorox box here? This is a, I'm going to take that, and I, what if I put that there? And then I took this and I set it right there like that. Try to put it in front of me. Maybe that's better. That's not so bad. Now I'm kind of looking at the screen. My keyboard's in the way, though. I'm playing around with this. I'm trying to figure it out. I should have figured this out before I started filming, though, huh? Shouldn't I? The problem is the cord is getting hung up here. Let me try that. That's not so bad. That kind of works. There we go. What do you think? Perfect. Got my neon sign behind me. I'll put my video bob thing back there. So this might be the trick. This might be the way I need to do it. I can also look here. I can make it wider. That helps, doesn't it? That way it's not so much. I need to position it so you could see my tube, my YouTube plaque better. <laughs> anyway, I thought I would do a show today. Um, why not? Because people are at home. They're hanging out. Um, I'd like to kind of lean back in the chair though. If I, you know, if I kind of get comfy, I'd have to, there we go. Yeah, that works. I like it. Okay. So my room is not cleaner. It's there's shit on the floor. There's stuff everywhere. I do need to clean up this room. Something terrible. Let's see. What's up, John H. Shaw over there. It's trans VD. I don't know what that means. Um, I have this one dark spot in my mustache for some reason. I look like Hitler. <laughs> it's like, you know, because... What the hell? Anyway, that's all I need. Let's see if we can adjust this a bit so that it's... Is that making a lot of noise? There we go. How's that? That doesn't work either. I don't like it. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> God damn it. Um, I have not watched the new Ghostbuster movie yet, believe it or not. Um, what is trans VD? What are you, what are you saying? I don't get what you're saying. Anyway, happy Zombie Jesus Day. Here we are. It's Easter. Um, let's see. Oh, it's... Biden says today is trans Transgender Visibility Day. All right. Great. I tried to watch your last live stream. Well, I made it private because that's why. Um... Yeah, you know, I I get into these these things. Oh, by the way, so like, well, the reason I made that last video private is because I had a problem with this guy, and um, I'm not, I already forgot his name. That's how insignificant he was. But so this dude came on, and and I rem he's a uh, he's a he's a 
I don't even call him a Kiss fan. What he is is he's a professional bootlegger. He's proud of being a, a plagiarist, basically. He's a bootlegger. He's a thief. And uh, he's made his living selling bootlegs. His YouTube channel is all bootleg concerts. He sells bootleg um, movies and concerts. Now, he calls himself an archivist because his argument is, well, you know, a lot of this stuff is being lost to time, and uh, so I'm archiving it, and I'm making it available to people because you can't get it anywhere else or whatever. But he doesn't own it, right? So he's a bootlegger. And he's been sued by the band Kiss because, um, you know, they sued him for $7 million or something like that because of all of his bootlegs. And um, so I don't think he's had to pay any of that, but I think that's how it went. Um, and I had asked Eric about this guy. I said, do you know this guy? And he goes, oh, you know, this guy, yeah, we, we are aware of him. And uh, he, he said, he, this guy brought a picture of me that was a, it said wanted dead for impersonating, you know, um, Peter Chris and wanted me to autograph it for him. And he stood in line and got my autograph. And, and he said, I laughed at it and I signed it anyway, whatever. So when I Googled this guy's name, everything that I found about him was that he, he's a stalker and he harasses people. When I Googled his name, I only found two things that existed. One was other YouTubers that complaining that he was a stalker who threatened him. And then the other was an interview he did where he basically brags about being a bootlegger. Okay. So apparently he lives here in Las Vegas and, and he was, he had sent me a message saying, um, it's strange that you and I have never met. We have a lot of com common, you know, interests and, um, you know, you, you seem like uh, somebody I should know or I, or I should be somebody you should know, something like that. And I was like, um, oh, really? Okay. So I asked Eric about him. That's when he told me, oh, he's like a stalker, basically. He's a... So, you know, the thing about KISS fans is that they're weird. We call them KISS tards, honestly. And so, and then he was like, you know, I said, well, you know, I was the announcer for KISS. And, and people love to bring up the fact that, oh, I only did it for a dollar. So I told Gene, I go, look, I'm donating my services. Take whatever salary that I would make and donate it to your Mending Kids organization or charity or whatever. But I'm volunteering my services uh, because um, I don't want the money. Like, I mean, listen, I'm not going to sit here and go, oh, I'm rich. I don't need the money. But, I mean, I don't, I didn't need the money, okay? What are they going to pay me? Like a couple thousand bucks or whatever, you know, like 5,000 bucks. I said, give the 5,000 bucks to a chair, to mending kids, okay? So, um, so people love to bring that up. Oh, you work for free. Donating your services to charity is, is, I don't know, you know, I don't know how to explain this to these idiots. And they're like, and, and why didn't I do it longer? Well, because they retired. The guy that was doing it before, unfortunately, he died. And they needed to replace him. And he had been doing it for like, I don't know, 15 or 20 years or something. And so um, the four members voted to use me. Gene, Paul, Tommy, Eric, and Doc listened to my audition and said, we like it, you got the gig. That's all there is to it, right? But, and so I only got to do it for three months. I only got to do like 20 or 30 shows because, um, well, they retired December 2nd. But it was a great honor and I, it, was, it was a great thing to do and, and I'm very um, humbly thankful for the opportunity. And uh, I didn't want to just, you know, I, I don't just do things. I, I don't do everything for money. Sometimes I just do things. Um, what was this? I saw it. Where did it go? Uh, awesome shirt. I picked this shirt because it's a cool shirt, but it also has Easter colors on it, right? It's got like some pink and some blue and some green. It's like an Easter egg. I looked at the shirt in my closet. I go, it looks like an Easter egg. I'm going to wear that today. Um, after all, it is a uh, transgender day. I should put this where it's almost right in front. Now you can see how shitty my room is. I'm trying to 
put it where because I'm you, it's pastels. Yes. Well, I'm reading your comments, which are on this column on the you know on the right side of me here. Um. So what else is going on? What other drama? Um, I think all the gypsies left town. They uh, we had an incident the other day where I haven't made a video about it, and and that's on purpose, but. Um, I was, they were right down the street from my house, right on the corner, and I pulled up and I go, oh my God, there they are. And they spotted me, and they attacked my car. I keep looking up where the camera used to be. They, they attacked my car, and, one, and they punched my car and put a little dent in it and shit. And, um, and, and that, you can imagine, pissed me off pretty hard. And then they got in their van and they took off, and I chased them down the street, and um, it was a big deal. So ever since then, I've been out looking for them. I've gone uh, every single day. I drive around for about two hours looking for them, and I can't find them. They're gone. They left. So I don't know how God, they're laying low. I've had a whole team of people driving around the entire city looking for them because there's going to be a major situation when they're found. They're, they're, we're going to be calling the police, filing some police reports, uh, we have video of this, and so I haven't put that on YouTube or anything yet because um, it's a pending investigation. But there's going to be arrests made. So um, yes, I did sell the Bluesmobile. It's gone. It's been sold. All right. What was this, Arthur? Oh, okay, you're saying hello to somebody. Um, so anyway. That's been going on. Uh, I'm doing some work out in the shop, working on uh, the old Rolls Royce and some other things. I just posted a new Bob Eats Vegas video this morning. Let's see, what is this? Um, I was watching an episode of Pawn Stars where you were trying to sell them your sports almanac from BTF. Experts said it was worth 2,500, but you wanted 7,500. Yeah, I sold that years ago for, I keep looking up where the camera used to be. I sold that for $8,500 at auction, and we donated the money to the Michael J. Fox Foundation. So I put it on eBay for a no reserve auction, benefiting Team Fox, and it sold for $8,500 to a fellow in the UK, or France, I think it was, somewhere like that. That's what actually happened. I just filmed two episodes of Pawn Stars here at the house, which will be airing in the coming months. So we filmed uh, the, me and Corey did an episode with the Scarface car. And we also did a thing with my pinball machines. So I haven't sold the pinball machines because I want to wait until the episode airs. Now, Pawn Stars isn't fake. The negotiations are real. The money is real. It's just prearranged. Uh, when I say prearranged, I mean you have an appointment with them. They come out. They film. It takes a few hours to do it, things like that. But... Um, it's not fake. It really isn't. Um, when they make an offer and you accept, they pay you money. You go down there and it's a pawn shop transaction. But they're a pawn shop. They're not going to buy stuff for retail. And I'm not going to just give my shit away so that I can be on TV. So yeah, they're going to come in and offer me, you know, I'm trying to sell a pinball machine for like eight grand and they're going to offer me four or whatever, you know. So because they're a pawn shop, they want to buy stuff for a quarter of its value. So um, it's not that it's, be and, 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 and they're going to bring their expert that comes in and says, your stuff isn't worth shit. That's what they do. <laughs> no, I'm not offended by it or anything. I'm not mad about it. That's what they do. They're pawn shops. They got to make money, right? So they buy low, sell high. That's their, That's their entire gig. So just keep that in mind when you're watching and, and they offer me a low thing and I don't take it. You know, they looked at my Ghostbuster, Elvira, and Back to the Future pinball machines and they wanted to buy them. And Rick really wanted my Ghostbuster machine. And I think he offered me eight grand for it or something like that. But it's worth like 15. But he knows that. That's why he wants to. If he's willing to pay eight, he has to sell it for double, right? So there you go. That's how much it's really worth. Um, I've been on there like five times, something like that. There's my uh, sister. Happy Easter, Renee. There you go. I see you. Uh, why sell the Scarface car? Because I, I, I want to sell it. I have too many cars. I have like 20 something cars. They got to go. Thoughts on Invincible Shield? That's the new Judas Priest album. I like it. I have it sitting right next to me. 
Uh, I'll show you. As many of you know, I have a Judas Priest tribute band. So I bought the everything package, of course. And this package came with a special seven inch bonus record, which is very good. Which if you buy the um, online or the, the Apple Music version, it comes with those bonus tracks. So this is the alternative cover, you know. This is what's cool about buying records. But I also custom ordered the picture discs. I mean, look at that, All right? I spent, I, I, I spent a couple hundred bucks on a, I bought the maximum package you could get. Let's see if the other record's much different. This is the other one. I think it's the same. Oh, it's got this guy on there. All right? How about that? However, I will say, as a vinyl guy, picture discs play like shit. For some reason, they don't sound as good as the softer black vinyl versions of the records. Because I also bought this in the regular black vinyl. And I think that I get kind of a drony noise coming off of these. Like I can hear kind of a, some kind of a noise. And uh, the black vinyl, which are 188 gram, I think the 180 gram thing is bullshit, honestly. On most record players like mine, it doesn't, it's not ma it doesn't make it better. So, personally, I believe as a guy who listens to records, I think that, um, there we go. I think that the regular, the regular thin black, I keep looking for the camera, the regular thin black vinyl um, versions, I think, are better than the picture discs. The picture discs are fun, but there's, they use a different plastic. They're using a completely different kind of plastic that's like harder or something. I don't know, but it just doesn't sound as good, in my opinion. And I have a thousand dollar cartridge needle. I mean, I have a diamond tipped sapphire cantilevered, you know, cartridge on this record player. So it's, which is nothing. I mean, there's people spending 20 grand on their record players, but it's not cheap. It's not like a Crosley is what I'm saying. So I don't know. We get, I, most of you probably don't know, don't know shit about records, but I'm just, I'm just saying, um, the picture discs aren't that great in my opinion. They're, you buy them because they're special edition. And I kind of, I'm not going to say I regret it, but I don't recommend it. Just buy the regular record if you want to listen to it. If you want to listen to it. I don't, I'm not into reel to reel, Edgar. No, I don't do that. Um, I've never been into that thing. Let's see. Um, oh, shit. I just. This whole thing just come off. Hold on. I'm trying to. Okay, there we go. Oh, damn it. Okay, not that big a deal. Um, I was going to answer somebody's thing. When are you starting? I'm. Wor we are working on our 59 millimeter car in Dallas, in Texas. So we're working on that stuff. Um, nerd alert. And then Queen Bob. Do you want to talk about the band Queen? Are you calling me a queen? I don't get it. Um, let's see. Are, am I using a webcam? I, I've taken the webcam and I just moved it down here. It used to be on top of my monitor. Uh, last night I was shopping for computers. I've been using the same uh, Apple Mac Pro they call it the cylinder, but it's also known as the trash can. I keep looking up where the camera used to be. I'm so used to it. So I've, I've been using a 2013 trash can, um, which was the maxed out version you could get. You know, it was the most maxed out version you could get if we're going to talk about electronics. Anybody who knows, knows this stuff. So the one I have is a late 2013, 2.7 gigahertz, 12 core, 
Xeon E5, I think that says, 128 gigs of RAM, 1066 DDR3. Uh, has a four terabyte SSD drive, which was a big deal back then, a huge deal. Um, AMD Fire Pro D700, six gig um, GPU. So when I put this, when I built that system, it was, I think I spent about five grand on it, I want to say. Wasn't cheap. So the one I'm looking at is the top spec Mac Studio. And it is 8,000 effing dollars. But I'm real, you know, I've, I've been having a little prop. I'm not having like problems with this computer. But it just takes a little too long to render. And I find like when I'm scrubbing through my video, it's, it's, it's sometimes I got to pause and let my memory buffer. And I'm just, it's, you know, the Irish Jip liked my Rira, my Rira. Uh, it's an Irish pub that I went to yesterday and um, had me a big Irish. I, I want to go back and have another one right now. It was pretty good. What'd you think? Had black pudding. What does Kevin say? Uh, my daughter's green. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, buddy. I know we're over here talking about computers and records, and then there's so many, so many things that are way, way more important. You know. Anyway, just let me finish this thought. Um, so the Mac Studio I'm looking at, it's 2023, 3.49 gigahertz M2 Ultra, 24 core, has a 76 core GPU, 192 gigs of RAM, and an eight terabyte SSD. And if I buy it from Apple, it's like nine grand. There's a guy who has one on eBay for eight grand. I offered him seven for it. That's a lot of money. But when I when you work on the computer all day long for basically your living, especially when you're doing videos, um, you know you you, you got to have a powerful system, and that's mid level. That's not even the Mac Pro. The Mac Pro starts at ten grand for a computer. That's only slightly better than the one I talked about. What's going on, honey? Oh, when is that? One, oh, okay, yeah, we'll go here shortly. We're going to go over to my friend's house for Easter dinner. Are we taking stuff? I mean, we don't have anything to take over there. He didn't say it was a potluck. We're going to go over, over to our friends. Um, speaking about what Sean was just talking about a second ago, um, I was talking about this with my wife last night. I said, you know, the thing is, is a friend of mine brought this up to me. He said, you know, you think you have your savings you think you have things put together you have you have money put away and then you get sick or your wife or your kid gets sick and it changes everything you know you go oh i put half a million dollars i got a million dollars put away for my retirement and then you get sick and then you have cancer or you have a tumor or you injure yourself or you can't work or you need a surgery, you need a treatment. And that happens to a lot of Americans. I was like, you know, you know, because I've always had the plan of just simply dropping dead. A lot of us have that plan, right? That like, that's our retirement. Like, I'm just going to keep working and then one day I'll have a massive heart attack and drop dead. That same friend who gave me that same speech when he went home while well, he was here visiting, and he went home and found that his brother had died. His brother had presumably had a heart attack while he was mowing the grass on a riding lawnmower. And they found him on the riding lawnmower in the backyard. And he had been there for three or four days. And that's how a lot of us assume it's going to be. You know, I'll be found in my bed or in this chair or out in my shop, my face down on the desk. You know, providing you don't have a trauma, you know, you're not hit by a bus or shot by somebody or something, right? So 
So really, you're lucky if you just drop dead. You have a heart attack, you just drop dead. My ex-wife was an ER nurse, an ICU nurse, and she used to tell me all the time that she would comfort people and say, hey, you know, if you have a widow maker and you're just, you're just down, gone, that's the, best there, that's the best that could happen to you. Just trust me. It's just like you're like, Ugh. that's it. You're dead before you hit the ground. Couldn't ask for more. Open casket. But when you get sick, and you go through years of chemotherapy and surgeries, and you deplete all your money, and you go through a bunch of pain and suffering, and that's the horror. Trying to take all my, all the pills that keep me alive. Or maybe they're killing me. I don't know. So did Elvis die on the toilet? He was in the bathroom. I don't know if he was actually sitting on the toilet. Maybe he was, but he was just found in his bathroom. Which is where he kept all his medications and shit. So I don't know if he was actually pants down, turd in the punch bowl, but I mean... He suffered from constipation because of his medication that he took. So he could have been on the toilet. <sighs> Poor guy. Anyway, oops. So I thought I would try out this camera angle, see how it works. I'll, I may experiment with this a bit. And... Um, I th just thought I would come on to a, a Sunday show. Um, let's see. How long did I live in Denver? I lived in Denver when I was a kid, so I was very young. So I lived there from about, I don't know, maybe 80, 80 81 to like, we moved in 87 to Fort Worth, Texas. And I lived in Denver proper, but I also lived in Arvada, Aurora, and Commerce City. We moved around a lot. I think my, my, grand, my Indian grandmother, my mom was married to an American Indian, a Sioux Indian named Jerry. And we lived with his mother, my grandmother, Unchi as it's known in the Sioux Indian language. So Unchi lived in, uh, I think, Arvada near a lake. There was a big lake walking distance from her house. So if you know where that is, I want to say that's Arvada. We lived in Denver in different apartment complexes because my mom would get a job as an apartment manager, which would give you free rent. And then my brothers would do maintenance in the apartment. And we lived off of Colfax, usually Colfax known as the ghetto strip. We lived in rough areas in Denver and um, I've, I went back a few years ago and just drove around the city but it's changed a lot I couldn't really locate any of the places where we used to live um, you don't hear a lot about Denver it doesn't make a lot of news but I've heard it's not that great so much anymore but you never really hear anybody talk about Denver But uh, yeah, I, I do remember the winters, the snow, shoveling snow for money, and uh, the mountains. And I remember I, I spent a lot of time going to um, Lakeside Amusement Park. It used to cost fifty cents to get in, and they'd tie a colored string around your wrist. That was your ticket in. And then uh, it was fifty cents to get in, or three dollars and fifty cents to ride all the rides, in which they put a little sticker on the string. And you could ride everything there for $3.50. But that was like early 80s, you know, mid 80s. But we moved in 1987 to Fort Worth, Texas, and been there ever since. And then I moved here uh, three years ago to Las Vegas. Um, so 
But we also lived in Kansas for a while. I lived in South Carolina with my birth father, I guess is the what we call it. And I also lived on the Rosebud Indian Reservation. You know, so from the time my mom married the Indian dude, you know, we I spent a couple of years here, a couple of years there. So I was all over the place in my childhood, you know. I was born in South Carolina, moved from there to Colorado Springs with my grandparents, then to Denver, then to Lawrence, Kansas, then to you know, Pine Ridge Reservation, Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota, then back to Denver, you know, and then uh, the Denver area, you know, Commerce City, uh, Arvada, Aurora, et cetera, and then um, moved to Fort Worth, where I moved around Fort Worth all over the place, all over Fort Worth, Haltom City, North Richland Hills, um, Watauga, downtown dallas bishop arts district oak cliff duncanville just all over the place man um am i going to do the ghostbuster fire station probably not i don't think that's going to happen so anyway I haven't been paying attention to some of the uh, comments. I got to get off here, though, because we're going to leave soon. Um, but anyway, I've been all over the place. You know, people have told me, oh, man, you should write a book. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I should. Who would read it, though? Who would care? I don't know. Anyway, um, what else is going on in the world of Video Bob? I'm, I'm going to be concentrating a lot. I, I need to work with somebody to really get my web stuff together. I need to build some websites, some commerce websites. I'm going to be working on this on my YouTube and online video presence a little bit more. So for instance, what I need to do with shows like my talk show, like Video Bob Show, is I need to cut those into little segments and upload those as reels and video clips. I need to work more on the Bobby's Vegas. And then on my main channel, I need to work on that as well. I need to put more time and effort into them so that they make revenue, you know. I got some friends that are doing YouTube and they're making real, you know, money. They're making like $40,000 a month on their YouTube channels. And I am not doing that. I'm just goofing around on here. But I'm realizing that this could be an actual job. You know, this could be real money that could be made. And, um, but I don't want to just like, the reason I don't work too hard on doing the Patreon and stuff is because I don't want to just bilk money out of you guys. You know, I got to give, there has to be a value, something that you get in return other than just my entertainment, you know, and I want to put together like some merchandise and some stores, but I don't want to just sell dumb tchotchke shit to rip off my fans. It's got to be good. It's got to be something good, you know. And everybody does t-shirts and mugs and all that kind of stuff, you know. So I'm like, I, I gotta, I want to offer value. I mean, I pay for things that I watch and stuff like that. I have, uh, th there are YouTubers that I actually Patreon. Only a dollar. It's only a dollar. I give them a dollar to be part of their Patreon and I get, but I get early updates. I get access to things I wouldn't normally be able to get and things like that. And there's some of you out there that would say, hey, I'll pay a dollar for that. But right now, my, my Patreon isn't set up to give you a benefit for that dollar. So I need to put together a system so that for those of you who want to, you know, give me a dollar, the thing is, it's only a dollar, but if I can get, you know, I have 156,000 subscribers on my main channel. Like, that's a lot. If, you know, 10% of those, if 1,500 of those people were giving me a dollar, I would pay my electric bill. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I pay a lot of money for it. And this is what me and the wife were talking about. We were sitting about talking about the future and how, you know, what we're going to do for money for different things. Because I have some money saved up. But what if something happens? What if there's a change? And things like that. And how to be more frugal about different things. How to uh, um, invest money into things that's going to return money. Because 
I'm if I if I'm, if I'm fifty now and then I live to be seventy, so you know, like I'm gonna need to make a lot of money over the next twenty years. So um, these are things that you start thinking about as you get older. You know, you don't want to end up under a bridge, sleeping outside Video Bob's house. I was pulling out of my driveway the other day. And as I'm pulling out, the gate opens. I look over to the left, and there's this fucking homeless guy laying down next to the wall where the entrance of the gate. And I get out of my car and go, seriously, dude? Of all the places you could have parked. And the dude was laying there eating crackers. He had some crackers and things. And he got up and he just ran into traffic and almost got run over by a truck. And just ran away. And I go, dude, come back here and get your crackers. So I was cleaning up his stuff, but here's where it gets weird. There's like a trash bag there, so I, I, I clean up his crackers and the snacks he was eating. And there was a bag of used kitty litter that he had pulled out of the trash somewhere. Why? Why? What was he doing with it? It's clearly he's mental. Maybe he's eating it. Why did he have a bag of used kitty litter that he pulled out of the trash and was carrying around with him? He didn't have a cat. <laughs> it's like cat turds and pee. Oh, my God, I don't want to throw up. Anyway, these people are mental. And I get into these um, discussions about what to do about the homeless all the time, and there's always this, there's always somebody defending their right to be homeless. They go, hey, man. You can't criminalize being poor. They have a right. I go, no, they don't. They don't have a right to trespass. They don't have a right to come onto people's property. They don't have a right to live on public space. I disagree. Right? Because every place that they go and are is on either public or private land that they don't have the permission to be on. They go, well, what's the harm? They're eating garbage. And I said, and this is what I say to those people. You think that it's more humanitarian to let people eat garbage and sleep on the street in the cold, the rain, or the heat without access to clean water, without the ability to clean themselves? You think that makes you a humanitarian and a libertarian to let people live that way as opposed to institutionalizing them in a way that they're taken care of because they're clearly mentally ill. And I think that the only solution to this is to have a huge facility, you know, in every city where you take these people, they're first analyzed, detoxified of whatever their chemical dependency is, and then uh, evaluated to see what their mental capacity is. And if they're completely mentally incompetent, then we just put them in a very low security home that is made for, it's not prison, but they can't leave. They're kept there where they have a nice apartment and they watch TV and they have some jello and the nurse brings them their medicine and they sit there and they watch TV. And there needs to be checks and balances and cameras and things to make sure that abuse isn't happening to them. Okay. And uh, make sure, you know, we, we need to have some kind of transparency to make sure they're not being abused. Cameras everywhere. They're going to lose all rights to privacy, but at least they're not being abused. And then, um, and then we as a society, we just pay for it. Like if I got a tax at the end of the year and it said $10 you know, tax that keeps homeless people off the street, I would gladly pay that. So who, what makes you a better humanitarian? Letting people sleep on the street and eat garbage or putting them in a place where they're taken care of. And then the other people that are simply alcoholics and drug addicts that aren't mentally ill are evaluated and then put through a mandatory job training based on their aptitudes. And then from there, they're put into a mandatory job placement for like a year that includes housing. And then from there, they can either continue working at that place or take their skills and move into the regular world again. And if they're busted being drug addicts and homeless people, they get sent back again for a longer period of time. 
but you can't, you, you know, why do we have dog catchers? Because you can't have feral dogs running around, or feral cats. You can't have coyotes running around in, in packs on the streets. Why do we have, why do we have dog catchers? And they go, well, these dogs get caught, they ca they're kept in a shelter, and then nobody adopts them, and then they're euthanized. Is, would you rather have a flea-bitten, mangy dog running around, packs of dogs, terrorizing people on the streets, tearing open their trash, killing their cats? You have to have solutions to these things in order to have a civilized society. And there has to be consequences for everything. Theft, vandalizing the city, you know, you're caught spray painting, you, go, you get punished. You're caught racing your car with loud pipes, you get punished. There has to be consequences to shit. Otherwise, we have lawlessness. Otherwise, you have Los Angeles. I don't want to live in L.A. I don't. Even if I had the money, I wouldn't want to live there. You have to have not only consequence, but solutions. So I'm not saying that homeless people should be punished, but they need to be dealt with. There has to be solutions. And I don't think that this is a party issue. It has nothing to do with Democrat or Republican. It has to do with hum being a human. How do, how do we take care of people? You can't have, you can't expect people to run a business or to walk around in society when they can't defend themselves against people that are going to rob them. You know, so you have to have severe penalties for everything. Spitting on the sidewalk. Ten days in jail. Because I don't want to walk around with spit on the sidewalk. You have to have that kind of law and order. Right? And then you start getting into, well, this is my right, and this is my this, and this is my that. I want to I want to live in a s nice, safe place that my wife can walk around without being worried about being robbed. So you have to have, uh, you have, to have the ability to control all of that. Anyway, um, all right, I'm going to wrap up quick today. We've been on here 42 minutes. That's fine. Oh, yeah, I agree. Um, all right, anyway, okay, thanks. We don't have to be there exactly at one o'clock. You're just standing there staring at me. Well, <laughs> you're, I feel you looming over me, look, staring at me. <laughs> Joe says, Happy Easter. I feel like I'm being uh, pressured. <laughs> I don't I don't have anything to take over there. No. All right, anyway, I'll catch you later. <laughs>